because uh, if you neglect this uh, you find that uh, um, uh, there is lot of water in the re refrigerant circuit and if you if you do not consider the presence of water there then the first of all the system may not function properly and the calculations will be different from the actual calculations. Okay. So, if you want to predict the performance properly you have to have the details of the rectification column, the construction details and all that and then you have to carry out this complicated analysis presented now and only then you can arrive at uh, reasonably accurate values. Okay. Sometimes the details may not be available and you have to do calculations uh, uh, without these de details. So, what is done uh, in such cases uh, is uh, when you in the absence of required data the COP is calculated by assuming that the deflagmator heat is a certain percentage of generator heat. Okay. So, normally you take a value of about 10 to 20 percent that means uh, what you do is you carry out the steady flow analysis of the system okay, taking the control volume across the entire uh, uh, rectifying system. Okay. So, as we have seen that will give you Q d minus Q d okay, which can be obtained easily. Then you assume that Q d is a certain percentage of uh, Q z. Okay. If you are making this assumption uh, then you can calculate Q z. Okay. So, this is a faster way of calculating. Of course, uh, this is not very accurate and you also have to know what is this percentage. So, normally a value of 10 to 20 percent is taken uh, in actual calculations. Okay. Now, let us uh, the systems we discussed so far. Uh, both water lithium bromide systems as well as ammonia water systems are, con are known as conventional absorption refrigerant systems. And you have seen that uh, they do not run purely on uh, heat because you also have to have a uh, certain amount of mechanical energy to run the solution pump. Okay. So, they are not purely heat operated systems because certain amount of uh, mechanical energy is also required. Okay. So, you also have absorption systems known as pumpless absorption systems okay. as the name implies a pumpless absorption reference system does not have a pump. Okay. Uh, let us look at some of these systems and what are the features of these systems. So, as the name indicates these systems do not, do not need a mechanical pump and what are the advantages of not having a pump? The advantages are high reliability with little maintenance due to absence of moving parts. So, in a pumpless uh, refrigerant system you do not have a moving uh, component at all. Okay. So, once you do not have any moving component uh, reliability will be extremely high okay. because there is a frankly speaking there is nothing that can go wrong in a pumpless system okay. and practically no servicing is also not requ is required. Okay. So, no maintenance is required, no servicing is required and very high reliability. Okay. So, this is one uh, major advantage of pumpless system. Okay. And uh, since you do not have any mo moving parts the operation will be perfectly silent. In fact, you do not know whether the system is working or not because it does not make any noise. Okay. Only when you feel the uh, inside you know that it is working. And a wide variety of heat sources can be used to run the systems. So, what are the applications of pumpless systems? The applications are uh, refri as refrigerators for remote and rural areas in portable refrigerators and as refrigerators for luxury hotel rooms etcetera. Okay. In luxury hotel rooms uh, uh, the customers do not want to have any noise. Okay. So, it has to be perfectly noiseless uh, inside the room. Okay. So, if you are using a normal uh, mechanical uh, vapor compression system uh, uh, the compressor will be making noise. Okay. So, sometimes uh, this will be disturbing. Okay. So, in uh, 5 star hotels and all uh, they use uh, the pumpless absorption systems as I said since it does not have any moving components it does not make any noise. Okay. So, this is one of the uh, major applications of pumpless absorption systems. Okay. There are several uh, pumpless systems uh, using both water lithium bromide and ammonia water. Okay. So, people have been working on these systems for la the last many decades. But out of these systems the most popular one is what is known as platen munter system or triple fluid vapor absorption refrigerant systems. Okay. So, let us look at uh, platen munter systems now. Platen munter system if you remember from our first lecture is the name of uh, the inventors platen and munters and uh, this system uses ammonia as refrigerant, water as absorbent and a third fluid uh, hydrogen as the inert gas. That is the reason why you call these systems as triple fluid vapor absorption systems okay, because you have three fluids. Unlike conventional systems the total pressure is constant throughout the system. So, since the total pressure is constant throughout the system you do not require a compressor or pump for pressurizing. 
okay. So, you at the same time you also do not require any expansion valve because the entire system operates at a single pressure. So, you do not require uh, anything for pressurizing the working fluid, okay. So, this is the major uh, uh, principle behind the these systems, okay. So, no need for mechanical pump. And to allow the refrigerant to evaporate at low temperatures in the evaporator, an inert gas is introduced into the evaporator absorber of the system, okay. So, if the uh, you have to when you are discussing pumpless uh, systems particularly plate and motor systems, you have to make a distinction between total pressure and partial pressure. So, far we have been talking about the pressure, okay. So, in this particular system uh, you have uh, a partial pressure and a total pressure, okay. So, the total pressure is the same inside the system, inside the entire system, okay, but the partial pressure will be different, okay. So, let us look at this. Let me first explain the principle. Okay. So, this is a schematic of uh, typical plate and motor system. This consists of a condenser, an evaporator, an absorber, a generator here and another component called as bubble pump. Okay. For uh, the sake of simplicity, I have uh, not shown the rectification column, deflagmator and all that, but in an actual system th those things will be there. Okay. So, we are assuming that we do not have any of those things. At the same time, we are getting pure ammonia at the end of this. Uh, bubble pump. Okay. So, let me explain the working principle starting with this point. So, at this point you have pure ammonia refrigerant okay. and this is at a high pressure. So, this pure ammonia refrigerant at high pressure enters into the condenser where it rejects the heat of condensation okay. and what you have at the exit of condenser is liquid ammonia, okay. liquid ammonia at high pressure. Now, this liquid ammonia at high pressure enters into the evaporator. Okay. So, in the evaporator in addition to ammonia we also have a third fluid called hydrogen. Okay. So, you have a pure hydrogen here. right? In fact, this pure hydrogen makes up for most of the pressure in the evaporator. Since total pressure is same for example, pressure at this point is let us say 15 bar. Okay. So, 15 bar liquid is entering into the evaporator and inside the evaporator the partial pressure of hydrogen is 14 bar let us say. Okay. So, hydrogen is uh, exerting a partial pressure of uh, 14 bar here. So, 14 bar is uh, because of hydrogen. So, what will be the pressure of ammonia here? The pressure of ammonia has to be the partial pressure of uh, ammonia because the total pressure is constant. So, in evaporator section you find that P total is equal to P ammonia plus P hydrogen okay. and the P total as we have seen is equal to 15 bar and out of this 15 bar hydrogen is making up for the 14 bar. Okay. So, that means the partial pressure of ammonia has to be 1 bar. Okay, so, there is a sudden this is somewhat similar to an expansion, but it is not expanding by, by throttling or anything, but it is by simply expanding by simply entering into a vessel where a third fluid is exerting a major portion of the pressure. Okay. So, during this process the ammonia pressure drops from 15 bar to 14 bar. So, here you have liquid ammonia at 1 bar. 1 bar ammonia liquid. Okay. Now, this 1 bar ammonia liquid uh, can uh, evaporate uh, at very low temperature because you find that at 1 bar it has an evaporation temperature of about minus 33 degree centigrade. Okay. So, in the evaporator it can evaporate uh, at minus 33 degree centigrade by taking heat from the refrigerated space. Okay. So, that is how you get the refrigeration effect. Now, as it evaporates what happens a vapor is formed. Okay. So, you see here that at point 3 vapor of uh, hydrogen and ammonia which are cooler because they are in the evaporator they go down because of buoyancy. Okay. So, this vapor consisting of ammonia and uh, hydrogen goes to the absorber. In the absorber what happens is the weak solution that is coming from the bubble pump. Okay. The weak solution coming from the bubble pump comes in contact with the mixture of hydrogen and ammonia. Okay. So, when uh, they come in contact what happens is ammonia is taken out from this mixer that means this solution uh, absorbs ammonia and it cannot absorb hydrogen. So, hydrogen is left out and ammonia is absorbed okay. and in this process hydrogen temperature increases. Okay. Since its temperature increases it becomes lighter and it moves up to the evaporator. Okay. So, that is how the hydrogen circulation is maintained from so, you have closed uh, hydrogen circulation from evaporator to the absorber because of the buoyancy effects. 
okay now what happens to the solution here you have solution now which is now stronger in this is a strong solution uh, stronger in ammonia now this is also at 15 bar so this goes to the generator in the generator heat is supplied so when uh, heat is supplied in the generator vapor bubbles are generated okay so you have vapor bubbles generated in the okay in the generator and vapor bubbles because of the buoyancy they move up so as they move up they carry some liquid along with them okay so that is the function of the bubble pump so in what are, what are we doing in a bubble pump in the bubble pump the vapor bubbles move the liquid from the bottom to the top because of buoyancy okay so this goes on till the end of the till the top of the bubble pump at the top of the bubble pump liquid goes down because of the gravity and vapor moves up because of the uh, by and see okay so that is how the whole system uh, works and you can see here that we are uh, rejecting heat at uh, absorber rejecting heat at condenser supplying heat uh, in the form of low temperature uh, uh, heat at uh, operator and the high temperature heat input takes place at the generator in addition to that you also have to su supply certain energy for the bubble pump to operate okay so here energy is required for generating the vapor as well as for operating the bubble pump okay and remember that the total pressure is constant at every point when i say constant there will be small differences because of the gravity heads and all for example if you look at this one pressure at this point will be uh, higher than the pressure um, at this point because of gravity head okay so this is the working principle of this and refrigeration is produced as a partial pressure of ammonia in evaporator is much smaller than the total pressure due to the presence of hydrogen as I have already explained. And uh, I am just giving an example if the total pressure as I said is 15 bar then it can condense at 38 degree centigrade and the partial pressure of hydrogen is 14 bar so partial pressure of ammonia is 1 bar in the evaporator that means it can evaporate at a minimum temperature of minus 33 degree centigrade. Now the liquid ammonia in the evaporator cannot boil in the evaporator as its partial pressure is lower than the total pressure. So this one uh, subtle difference is there between uh, this system and the earlier system. Here because of the presence of uh, hydrogen boiling cannot take place what takes place is evaporation that means you will not find any vapor bubbles here simply the uh, ammonia liquid uh, evaporates into the hydrogen gas. So this is somewhat similar to the evaporation of liquid water in atmosphere okay this uh, takes place as long as hydrogen gas is not saturated with ammonia and the ammonia vapor generated is carried away by the process of diffusion hence plate and monitor systems are also called as diffusion absorption system sometimes people use the name diffusion absorption systems for plate and monitor systems so as i said why do we call it as diffusion absorption system because here the process is not one of boiling but it's one of evaporation and then diffusion okay so this is a subtle difference right so that's why we call it as diffusion absorption systems okay due to the evaporation process of the temperature of the evaporating liquid changes along the length of the evaporator this is another difference you will find that inside the evaporator the temperature is not constant okay you have a cold region and you have a progressively increasing region with the progressively increasing temperature and the coldest part is obtained at the end where hydrogen enters the evaporator so why the this part is coldest because at this part the partial pressure of ammonia is least okay so it can evaporate at lowest temperature this can be beneficially used to provide two temperature sections in the evaporator for example if you are using this system for a refrigerator you can use the coldest part for frozen food storage and the uh, so relatively warmer part for fresh food storage this is what is done in commercial uh, refrigerators uh, and the uh, circulation of fluids inside the system is achieved as i said due to the effects of buoyancy and gravity head and the liquid field is required at the end of the condenser to prevent the entry of hydrogen gas into the condenser that means uh, at this point you have to have a liquid field okay uh, if you do not have this liquid field what happens is some of the hydrogen can enter uh, into the condenser okay hydrogen can enter into the condenser to prevent the hydrogen entry we have to provide a liquid field okay gases other than hydrogen can also be used even though the original system used hydrogen gas people also tried other gases such as helium 
and platen motor systems uh, are uh, simple and uh, good in many ways. Uh, one major disadvantage of this system is that they offer very low COPs okay, and the COPs are of the order of 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 and this is because of the energy requirement of bubble pump and also due to various irreversibilities. One such irreversibility is due to the cooling and heating of hydrogen gas in the evaporator absorber section. And additional heat exchangers are used in commercial systems to improve COP. Okay. Commercial systems will be different from the schematic shown uh, earlier. Okay. However, in commercial systems a wide variety of fuels such as uh, electrical heaters in small systems or you can also use natural gas or LPG or kerosene in larger systems. Okay. Again let me um, Okay, a typical as I was mentioning uh, of the heat exchanger part, you can have a in a commercial system, you can have a heat exchanger here where the cold uh, vapor that is going to the absorber section can uh, transfer heat, uh, can take heat from the hot vapor that is going to the hot hydrogen gas that is going to the evaporator. So, you will have one heat exchanger here. Okay. Similarly, you can have another heat exchanger here. Okay. So, that means you can preheat the solution that is going to the generator okay. and uh, the heat source here can be anything. You can use for example, LPG gas or you can use natural gas, you can also use kerosene, you can use hot water or you can use hot oil or anything. Okay. And uh, let me very briefly explain the solar energy driven uh, systems. I will not explain, but I will just state uh, absorption systems can also be run purely on uh, solar energy. If you are using a conventional system, then the solution pump requires, which requires mechanical energy can be driven using a turbine driven by the high pressure vapor generated in the generator. That means, you can have a turbine which uh, utilizes some of the high pressure vapor generated in the generator or you can also use photovoltaic cells and have a motor and run the pump using that motor. Okay. And if you are using a pumpless system, of course, you do not require any mechanical energy and you can operate it purely on solar energy alone. Now. And solar energy driven refrigerant systems can also use what is known as solid adsorbents. Okay. Some of the examples of solid adsorbents are water silica gel, where water is the refrigerant, silica gel is the adsorbent, water zeolites, zeolite is adsorbent, methanol activated carbon system, methanol is the refrigerant and activated carbon is the refrigerant, ammonia calcium chloride system, hydrogen metal hydrate systems. Okay. However, these systems have not been commercialized on a large scale. Let me just show a table where the compression systems are compared with absorption systems. Okay, so, this uh, table shows the uh, comparison between compression and absorption systems. So, you can see that compression systems are work operated, absorption systems are heat operated, compression systems offer high FOP, absorption systems offer low FOP. Now, let me quickly summarize what we have learned in this lesson. In this lecture, uh, working principle of ammonia water systems is explained, principle of rectification is discussed method for evaluating steady state performance is presented and pumpless systems are discussed and solar energy driven systems are mentioned and finally, comparison is made between compression and absorption systems. In the next le le lecture, le we will look at some of the problems on compression and absorption systems. Thank you.